W sections are some of the most commonly used structural steel sections as beams and columns. How would we go about designing W sections and columns? What is the fastest way available? How would that be different if the column was braced? And how would it be different if the section is built up and has slender elements? All of this will be clear by the end of this video. Inner columns of steel sheds are mainly assumed to have pinned ends. Here we are limited to choosing from sections of depth of 14 inches and of ASTM A992 material that would be as light as possible but still be able to carry the given dead and live loads. We will approach this problem by using the fastest and easiest method which is by using the AISC construction manual. The steps to follow are determining the ultimate load by using the suitable load combination from ASCE7. Then determine the column effective length. Finally, we will select the suitable section from the AISC manual tables. From ASCE7 chapter 2, we can see the basic load combinations, where D is the dead load and F is the flood load, T is the self-straining force and L is the live load. H is the lateral load that might be caused by earth pressure, water pressure, or bulky material leaning on the structure. Because we only have dead and live loads, the second load case would generate the highest ultimate load. This would give us the expression for the ultimate load as follows. Using table C-A-7.1 from the AISC specifications commentary, we can determine the effective length by multiplying the length factor K with the member length L. We have to differentiate between the strong and weak axis of bending. Because both ends are pinned at the member ends, the chosen K would be from KC and that is 1. This means that the effective length for both axes is 30 feet. Because our X is greater than our Y, Y is the weaker axis in bending and thus our Y will govern. Because we are limited to choosing W sections of depth of 14 inches, we go to W14 sizes in table 4-1 in the AISC manual and look at the raw with an effective length of 30 feet. We can see that the lightest section with a compressive strength higher than the ultimate load of 840 kips is W14 by 132 with a strength of 893 kips and thus we choose W14 by 132 as our column. In the next problem, we will investigate how the previous design would change if the member is to be braced about the weak axis Y at the mid-span. Again, the ultimate load is 840 kips. So we have an effective length of 30 feet in the X axis and the effective length of 15 feet in the Y axis. Because the tables give the strength only with respect to the effective length about the weak axis Y, we can convert the effective length in the X axis to that in the Y axis by dividing it by the ratio of RX to RY found at the bottom of the table. This gives us an equivalent effective length in the Y axis of 18 feet, which is greater than 15 feet and thus X will govern. Using 18 feet as an effective length, the lightest section that would have a compressive strength higher than 840 kips is W14 by 90. We can of course also see that the strength is higher than 840 kips in the Y axis as well by using 15 feet in the table as an effective length. So what would we do if the W section we want to evaluate the compressive strength of is not available in table 4-1 in the AISC manual? In this case, we are trying to evaluate the strength of a W14 by 132 column with an unbraced length of 30 feet in both axes with a material of ASTM A992. From the AISC manual table 2-4, we can extract the following yield and ultimate strength for the material. We can also extract the geometric properties of the section from table 1-1 in the AISC manual. We can see that for a W14 section with a nominal weight of 132, Rx and Ry have the following values and the cross-sectional area is 38.8 .8 square inches. Because the critical stress of a member in flexural buckling is a function of slenderness ratio as well as the elastic modulus E and the yield strength Fy 
as discussed in the previous video that I linked in the description down below. We can use table 4-14 in the AISC manual to extract the critical stress for a material with a yield strength of 50 KSI. Now we need to determine the governing slenderness ratio, which is the highest slenderness ratio from either X and Y axes. Because our Y is lower than our X, and the KL is same at both X and Y directions, the highest slenderness ratio will be in the Y axis. We can interpolate the following values in the table. Thus, we end up with a critical stress of 23 KSI. This means that the compressive strength is the area multiplied by the critical stress, and that gives 892 kips. Note that this is the same as the tabulated compressive strength value from table 4-1. Let us repeat the same exercise with the column being braced in the middle about the y-axis. We can check the highest slenderness ratio as follows. Because the slenderness ratio is higher in the x-axis, it will govern. From the AISC specifications equation E3-4, we can find the elastic flexural buckling stress as follows. Afterwards, we check whether the column will buckle elastically or inelastically by checking whether or not the slenderness ratio exceeds the limit specified here, which is a function of the elastic modulus E and the yield strength Fy. Because the slenderness ratio is less, the column is considered short and bulky and will buckle inelastically. Because the column is inelastic, the critical stress equation will be taken from AISC specifications equation E3-2 and the nominal compressive strength will be the section area multiplied by the critical stress. Notice that the strength is not yet reduced by the compressive strength reduction factor phi, unlike the tabulated strength values, and thus we multiply the nominal strength by the reduction factor of 0.9 to achieve the final compressive strength of 927 kips which is greater than the ultimate compressive load of 840 kips. Alternatively, because we know the column will fail due to flexural buckling, we can again use table 4-14. We can interpolate the values to get phi FCR, and thus the compressive strength is just phi FCR multiplied by the section area, which gives 928 kips, almost same as the previous results using the AISC specifications instead of the manual tables. Using the AISC specification equations, although is lengthier, can be used in general for all possible cases and is more comprehensive as we will see in the next example. Because the manual table 4-14 assumes the member fails due to flexural buckling and would not work if the member were to fail due to torsional or flexural torsional buckling. Similarly, table 4-1 does not include all W sections or all possible structural steel shapes like built-up sections. What would change if we were to evaluate the strength of a built-up W section made of 1 over 4 inch thick plate for the web welded to 1 inch thick plates for the flanges? Well, when it comes to the material, we again use table 2-5 in the AISC manual to extract the material properties of ASTM a572 grade 50. We can also summarize the main geometric dimensions from the given sketch as follows. Now we need to calculate the moments of inertia of the section about its y and x axis in order to be able to calculate the radii of gyration rx and ry. For that we break down the section into three rectangles. The moment of inertia of a rectangular section is calculated by multiplying the width by the height cubed divided by 12. And thus, the moment of inertia about the y-axis of the flanges is this, and for the web it is this. Thus, we determine IY and consequently RY as follows. For the moment of inertia about the x-axis, the x-axis does not coincide with the centroids of the flanges but rather shifted by 8 inches. This has to be accounted for using the parallel axis theorem. This will give us the following value for Ix. The area of the cross section is the sum of the area of the rectangles and the wells are ignored. The ultimate applied compressive load 
is also calculated using the same previously used load combination. Because IY is less than IX, Y slenderness will govern, and thus we use it to calculate the elastic stress for flexural buckling as follows. Because this section is doubly symmetrical, we also have to check the elastic stress for torsional buckling, and thus we need to calculate the warping constant CW as well as the torsional constant J. From the AISC specifications chapter E4, user note we can calculate the warping constant as follows. And from the AISC design guide 9 equation 3.4, we can calculate the torsional constant. Now we can calculate the torsional buckling elastic stress using AISC specifications E4-4. The elastic modulus is 29,000 KSI. The shear modulus is 11,200 KSI. K is 1 and L is 15 feet converted to inches and thus multiplied by 12. This gives us an elastic stress of 91.9 KSI which is greater than the flexural buckling elastic stress of 38.3 KSI and thus flexural buckling governs. To investigate whether local buckling is an issue, we have to check the slenderness of the section elements. The two elements we need to check are the flanges and the web. Let us start with the flanges by referring to table B4.1A in the AISC specifications to check the width to thickness ratio and the limiting width to thickness ratio before the section is considered slender. First, we calculate the value Kc using the note at the bottom of the table. Then, we check the width to thickness ratio of the flange and compare it to the limiting ratio lambda r. We see that it is less and thus flanges are non-slender. This means that the flanges have no risk of local buckling before the column buckles globally. Similarly, we check the table for the width to thickness ratios for the web. We determine the width to thickness ratio of the web and compare it to the limiting ratio. It is greater and thus the web is slender and will have a risk of local buckling before the column buckles globally. This is accounted for by reducing the area used to calculate the nominal strength Pn to the effective area Ae. First, the effective width of the slender element is calculated by using equations E7.1 in the AISC specifications. Let us check the condition by first calculating the elastic local buckling stress and the critical stress. This allows us to calculate the right hand side of the inequality. Because the width to thickness ratio exceeds that value, we use the second expression to calculate the effective width of the web. Finally, the effective area of the section is calculated by adding the effective area of the web to the area of the flanges. This allows us to calculate the nominal strength and consequently the final compressive strength of the column. It is larger than the ultimate compressive load and thus it is sufficient for this use. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.